The online universe certainly features some unsavory spaces and voices. One such example is the troll. In folklore, that meant a monstrous or fiendish being. Turns out it's actually a fairly apt description for the social media landscape, too. But unlike mythical ones, the online trolls actually exist and make the lives of real people miserable. With us now on who they are and why they do it, we're joined in Melbourne, Australia by Evita March. She is Senior Lecturer in Psychology at Federation University, Australia, and we are delighted to welcome you to our airwaves tonight, Evita. Uh, how do you define a troll? Let's start there. Ooh, really going in with the uh, big questions. <laughs> so let's start with that. Uh, how I define a troll. So when I started researching trolling about 10 years ago, how we defined a troll then and how we define a troll now has really come to mean different things. And I think it would surprise people to learn that the term trolling, particularly online, actually dates back to the mid-90s. It only really started reaching popularity and becoming common in media in about the early 2010s. Now, originally, trolling in those 90s days, the Wild West of the internet, referred to throwing out a came from the fishing term trawling, throwing out a baited line and reeling people in. Now, this has gone under a lot of manifestations over time. Now we come to think of trolling as really a catch-all for any kind of antisocial, abusive behaviour online. But for us to research trolling scientifically, the defini definition we use is that it is an antisocial online behaviour where a user will post menacing or provocative inflammatory comments that are designed to incite and upset other people. All right, let me give you three different terms and you tell me if they're essentially the same or if they're different. You've just told us about trolling. Trolling, cyberbullying, online harassment. Are they all basically the same? So, so, so trolling has become a catch-all to refer to any kind of antisocial behaviour online, but there actually are distinctive differences in the definitions of those behaviours. So cyberbullying, the very definition of cyberbullying, is a repetitive behaviour. It is repeated aggression. So a one-time instance of aggression or harassment would not constitute the definition of cyberbullying. But what's also important in our research is we have found that there are different predictors of these behaviours. So one market example between cyberbullying and trolling we have found is that people who cyberbully tend to have lower levels of self-esteem, where Whereas for people who troll, there is no relation to self-esteem. So we do see a difference in the psychological predictors of these behaviours, which reinforces to us that there's different motivations. There's something different going on. Hmm. But the other behaviour you asked about, Steve, was harassment. And harassment itself does imply that repeated behaviour. Harassment is, it's harassing, it occurs repeatedly. So harassment might actually benefit the definition of cyberbullying. But what has become quite complex is that term trolling has been picked up to refer to really any kind of cyber abuse. Now, I think the stats show that uh, as many as 85% of Canadians are not on Twitter at all. So they may have heard about this, but they may not have actually seen it or done it. So I want us, let's do an example here of just trolling, which you equated with a kind of a menacing behavior. Give me a, give me a, um, okay, troll me right now with a menacing tweet. What would you say? <laughs> I think this is the first time I have been asked to do that. <laughs> so we've got two different kinds. The first kind of trolling, if I was going to be the OG troll, the original prankster troll, then I might tell you, Steve, that you have something on your face and you have had it on your face for the past few minutes that you have been talking to me and you really should go check that before you come on camera. Have I made you feel a little bit uncertain, a little bit unsure? If you're referring to my nose, then no. But if you're referring <laughs> to something else, then maybe, okay. And that's trolling. That's that trolling. And that could be, maybe you went and had a look and was like, yep, I was referring to your nose. Ha ha, we have a laugh. Perhaps no real harm done. Now, what we perhaps have come to think of as trolling, and I won't direct this to you, Steve, because I'm a bit too nice for that, but would just be telling somebody that they should go kill themselves. They don't deserve to live. Or that you're going to come and kill them and you're waiting for them in the car park and you're going to beat them up, you'll find them. Sending somebody horrific, menacing, vile comments that actually in, in, 
in my opinion, borders on cyber abuse. It is that intention to harm somebody that distinguishes that original, the trickster, the prankster troll online from now what we have seen, which I term malicious trolling. It is defined by the intention to harm someone or that any normal average person would define as the intention to harm. Why don't we do uh, an example now of, uh, well, let's say, let's say a uh, more, more serious example, maybe plucked from the actual headlines. Famous people. Lots of famous people troll these days. Want to give an example of that? Mm. So a lot. <laughs> I'm often asked, and this is a very curious question, if Donald Trump is a troll. And it's a good question because if you just take the very definition that I said before, posting inflammatory or provocative comments that are designed to get a rise and upset others. Well, I'm, a lot of people would meet that behavioral definition of trolling. I think we could make a pretty safe assumption that quite a few politicians would be engaging in trolling behavior. And that's why it really is important to make that distinction between what they're intending. So if it is actually designing to provoke others, engage them, uh, ha create or incite, upset people, or if it really is the intention to hurt an individual, just wanting to cause somebody pain. Hmm. In your experience, does trolling tend to take place more often by individuals or by a coordinated effort by like-minded people? It really can go both ways. I mean, typically we will see that it can be liked by an individual, the lone wolf working alone, but we have seen more and more that there are coordinated groups. And really interestingly, not just for what we might consider antisocial purposes, a coordinated group that I've come across quite often in my research is what we will term the vigilante troll or the activist troll. So it's a coordinated group that are strategically targeting groups or communities online like the anti-vaxxers where the group will actually work to troll this particular, whether it's the anti-vaxxer group, but it's a coordinated attack. And it's almost, it's really quite interesting talking to people who do this because they believe that they are behaving for a pro-social cause. Now, this really seems to differentiate from when we see more of a particular pile on behavior. So when a number of people might attack a public figure for either some kind of behavior instance, that coordinated vigilante or activist troll seems to be quite different than when there is a bit of a pile on to either a public figure celebrity. And again, in your research, is it the right wing crazies or the left wing crazies who do more trolling? Hmm. I do not have and have not researched the ideology, so I will leave that to your probably rather safe assumption. But I will note that there does seem to be more extremist ideology that is associated with more malicious forms of trolling. All right. How about this? Who trolls more, men or women? Well, that, however, is not out for debate. Uh, I have, across quite a few research studies now, found that men do tend to engage in more trolling behaviours than women do. Now, there is a caveat. I have found sometimes no difference between men and women's trolling rates. And this, I speculate, to perhaps be context dependent. One interesting platform where I found women were just as likely to engage in trolling behaviours as men was on Tinder. So read into that what you will. But I will note that I've never found women to troll more than men. Either men have trolled more than women, and that's quite a reliable finding, or there seems to be similar rates of trolling. I, I must confess, uh, the fact that men troll more than women does not come as a surprise to me, or I suspect any of our viewers or listeners. But I wonder who's on the receiving end. I wonder if men troll other men more or do they troll women more? It's a really 
good question. And in hindsight, I wish I had asked that in earlier stages of research who they were trolling. Because once we found these gender differences, we weren't as sure of who was actually on that receiving end. But we do have some pretty good statistics now to show that women do disproportionately experience cyber harassment than men do. So I think it's a pretty safe assumption that we do know who is more often on the receiving end. But in addition to women, we also see the intersectionality between women or gender diverse people, people of colour, do tend to experience cyber harassment. More so, more minority or vulnerable groups do tend to receive disproportionately higher rates of trolling. Hmm. You know, the, the New York Times ran a front page story, uh, this, uh, well, I guess it was yesterday, the Sunday New York Times, and they had basically gone back over uh, years of, I guess it's trolling, I don't know there was any other way to describe it, by um, members of Congress in the United States. And they put a bunch of them up there, dozens and dozens of uh, examples of tweets. And I, I was sort of saddened to discover that female members of the House of Representatives were equally as awful uh, in quality and in style of trolling than their male counterparts. Uh, I was disappointed to see that. How about you? How do you react to that? I think that actually, there's a really important caveat to make in my research discussing gender differences. And that is, I have found that there are other variables that are stronger than gender. And these are personality traits. So other variables that I've explored include the personality traits of sadism, so enjoying causing others harm, and also trait psychopathy. So being callous, a lack of personal responsibility, and a lack of guilt for your own actions. And comparative to gender, sadism and psychopathy are stronger predictors of perpetrating trolling behaviors. So there, it really doesn't matter if you identify as a man, identify as a woman, identify as gender diverse. If you have higher levels of sadism and psychopathy, you are more likely to be engaging in those trolling behaviors. So gender doesn't really matter there. If you enjoy causing harm, you are callous, and you lack a sense of guilt and responsibility for your actions, you are more likely to troll. That's a, that's a very interesting point, and I guess my disappointment stems from the fact that, that, as you've confirmed here and as we have all suspected, women are far more likely to be on the receiving end of disgraceful trolling by men, which is, I guess, one of the reasons why I foolishly hoped that um, women in a position of responsibility, for example, political leaders, wouldn't stoop to the same stupidity that some of their male counterparts stoop to. But no such luck, I guess. Have you noticed that as well? You know, it's funny. One of the best predictors of cyberbullying is if you have been cyberbullied. So one of the best predictors of then you intentionally perhaps harming someone online is if you have been or you have experienced this yourself which is really counterintuitive to what we might think, right? Like we would think if you experience this, you know how harmful and impactful it could be. So you're far less likely to engage in that behavior yourself. But the evidence doesn't seem to suggest that. In fact, experience in a behavior is a very powerful predictor of you performing that behavior yourself. So if you do consider that a one group might be more likely to experience this behavior in general, then it does stand to reason that that group may then also engage in that behavior. Hmm. All right, let's talk harm. Uh, and again, at the risk of uh, getting too auto autobiographical here, uh, every day of my life in this job, I get trolled. It is just part of the, you know, it's part of the price of entry for doing this kind of work. And I'm a white man. So I presume that uh, black women, for example, probably get it, uh, you know, 10 times as much as I do, and the quality is a lot harsher as well. I know in my case, I let it roll right off my, like water off a duck's back. I just, I do, I do not take it in, and I do not, at least I don't think I allow it to affect, uh, adversely affect me. Uh, but that may not be typical. Why don't you tell us what the typical uh, result is of, of over-the-top trolling? Well, Steve, I will confirm it's not typical. It's not water off a duck's back. Mm -hmm. So I think that that resilience is incredibly powerful. 
But the typ typically the impact that we do see and people who are targets of trolling do experience psychosocial impacts. So psychologically, we see increased levels of anxiety, depression, suicidal ideation, and in some cases, even suicide attempts. There's physical symptoms as a result. So weight loss, weight gain, loss of sleep, um, insomnia as well. But in addition, there can even be financial costs and legal costs. So having to launch in legal proceedings, there's a huge range of impacts that experiencing trolling can have. But I think a really important distinction also to make whilst we've been discussing men and women as impact is we've established, although there is a trend for men to perpetrate trolling more so than women, that women do still engage in this behaviour. We know that. And I have found my research as well in some studies, there's no difference in the amount of trolling they're engaging in. But a gender difference we do know exists is that it does seem to have a greater impact on women when they experience it. So women who experience trolling are more likely to report those more severe psychological impacts, impacts on their confidence and self-esteem, and even as far as their concentration. There's one study that reported off women who experienced online harassment, over 60% said it interrupted their impacted their concentration afterwards. So we know that being a woman or gender diverse individuals may have an experience in this may have a greater psychological effect. Can you tell, this may seem like a perfectly ridiculous question, but can you tell me why? Why is it that somebody who is on the receiving end of trolling wouldn't conclude, as I do, that the person doing the trolling is an unhappy, miserable person who's trying for their 15 minutes of fame or attention by uh, engaging in antisocial behavior, which is why it has no impact on me, why do they not come to that conclusion? Why do they come to a different conclusion which allows that, that effort to harm them? Hmm. I'm not sure I agree with the term allow. I think it facilitates it. By allowing it, we might not allow ourselves to feel that or allow it to have that impact, but it may facilitate us feeling that way after we might experience that kind of behavior. I don't think that there is one simple answer to this. And I don't think the answer is also resilience. In fact, I would say that people who would experience such high significant rates of trolling, who then go through the subsequent psychological impact and come out on the other side, they demonstrate great resilience compared to those who may not have been impacted in the first place. I think that there are lots of reasons why it might have that significant impact. And one reason could simply be because we are social creatures that have a high need to belong. And being socially attacked and publicly humiliated can really make us feel bad about ourselves. I mean, it could just simply be as, as, as simple as we want to be accepted. We like to belong. Another less simple answer is that when we do consider um, who might be being trolled, we do also find that women do and gender diverse people do tend to experience more ad hominem trolling. Sorry, more of a comment on you, your personal physical characteristics rather than, say, an intellectual disagreement. But I think broadly, it really could be as simple as it just hurts to be abused. And maybe some people might be able to have it roll up their backs, but for others, it might not be that simple. Well, is it ever a good idea to engage with trolls or even go even further, say, fight back or get into an argument with them? In one of my earlier research studies, in addition to those personality traits, I found that one of the most powerful predictors of people trolling was something called negative social potency which sounds as ominous as it is, negative, potions, negative social potency refers to atypical social rewards. So atypical social rewards are people who feel rewarded and motivated by behaving antisocially. They actually feel enjoyment and a sense of reward when they create social mayhem. And when we put this in a model predicting trolling with those personality traits and gender, it blew everything else out of the water. If you were motivated to create social mayhem and you felt a sense of reward by doing so, you were extremely likely to engage in trolling. Now, after that result, I also jumped on the bandwagon of the adage, don't feed the trolls. Mm. Because based on those findings, that's what they wanted. 
if you gave them the, that reaction, that's what they were after. That reaction reinforced them. So it really was like the, also the old habit of bullies, like just ignore it and it will go away. But what I would find is like bullies, if you do ignore it, they need that response and they're going to up the ante. And I think that's a really important message in that if you do ignore this, it is likely to escalate and get worse before it stops, before it goes away. That's almost a typical pattern of what we see. But I've also come to a bit of a different tune of don't feed the trolls because I don't think that we should ignore it. I don't think that we should engage with this. I think that it has gotten to the point that by perhaps by ignoring this, we have almost normalised this behaviour, allowed it to fester. And now we have gotten to a point where we almost consider online abuse, harassment, trolling to be endemic. It's a natural part of being online. And I think that is a greater problem. We need to acknowledge it. We need to have these discussions and talk about that it is a real societal problem. Uh, I've got a friend who works for the Toronto Star. His name's Robert Benzie, and he gets trolled a lot uh, on Twitter. And his response is usually to say, uh, thank you so much for your comment, uh, and I'm delighted to be working for Canada's largest circulation newspaper. Hope you'll continue to read the paper. That kind of thing. Sort of a tongue-in-cheek response. Is that a good way to handle these things? Actually, I actually think it's an excellent way to handle it. It's a really nice way to diffuse it. So I said, responding and instigate, letting them know that it has also gotten to you is the response that they are looking for. I once saw a talk on the best way to deal with cyber bullies or bullies in general was when they bullied you to return them a compliment. And it's so disorienting and disarming. They don't know what to do. They weren't expecting to receive a compliment back. It almost, you can see the confusion of they don't know how to handle this. Now, I'm not at all saying that, um, and that, that could really go, take it to the next level of returning with a compliment. But diffusing the situation, almost thanking them, it's just, this, how do you respond to that? They may come back and try again. And maybe he responds the exactly the same way. And eventually, they're not going to get the reaction that they're looking for. So they may stop overall. Lots to think about there. Avita March from Federation University, Australia. We thank you so much for joining us on TVO tonight. Thank you. Bye. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.